Um, I don't know how to intro this, so we'll, 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 we'll sync clap. Hi, Tawanda. Hey, Valentine. How's it going? Good, thanks. How are you? Very good. Uh, thank you for welcoming us to your uh, your very, very exclusive chalet here in the hills of Harare, where Precision Aerial nests. <laughs> very few people have come here. Like, legitimately, very few people have been allowed in this site. Yeah, thank you. Well, welcome to my space. This mm. is us. This is, this is Precision Aerial. Mm. Mm. Uh, last time we spoke, you were in Kenya. Yeah, um, that was a couple of weeks back. Um, I was there for, I was there in August, right? Yeah. Um, I was there for about uh, two and a half weeks. Mm. Um, yeah, quite an interesting trip. Uh, a lot of fun stuff that I saw there mm. and uh, some cool things. You see, you say that very conservatively. Like I saw some really, really fun stuff and some yeah. cool things. But, you know, let's get, let's get into the details. Because last time you, we yeah. spoke, you were like um, the difference in uh, engagement between the Civil Aviation Authority of Zimbabwe and mm. the Kenyan equivalent. Mm. So they're on a whole, whole different levels in terms of interest. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not just the civil aviation authorities themselves, mm. um, just in terms of the differences between what's happening in Kenya and in Zimbabwe. Mm. The difference is, is in the actual approach that the governments themselves have taken, right. um, just in terms of wanting to promote innovation uh, within the drone technology industry and space. I think there's been a lot more effort made mm. uh, in Kenya than in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe has made an effort, but it's more on the regulatory ah. side. So the civil aviation are trying to regulate and get things in place and, and implement. But mm -hmm. on the innovation side, um, you know, there aren't really spaces or any, any any actual tangible effort on the ground we've seen to create an environment for innovation and development. Mm -hmm. um, and in innovation development is really looking at creating a space where people can experiment mm -hmm. and test uh, different use case applications for drones. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if people want to test... Uh, you know, medical uh, drone delivery uh, type of thing, or even just any kind of cargo delivery systems, yeah. right? There's nothing be that's been put in place here locally in Zimbabwe that encourages it or yeah. promotes it yeah. outside of just regulating it and saying, here are the rules that yeah. you have to follow if you want to do that. Where you look at Kenya, Kenya, for example, um, you know, their government has taken a step where they've actually created what we call like a drone corridor mm -hmm. or an area where they've marked out and said, hey, Anyone who's interested in developing any kind of drone tech, you know, the different types of drones that exist, here's a space where you guys can do it. Here's mm. an environment where we're saying, come and test your things out. Come and do it, all right? Because we want to have local people in Kenya who mm. are developing technology and move away from this aspect of just, oh, importing drones and buying drones from other countries and using them. They want to create a space that helps um, the local uh, industry to actually grow and mm. thrive. So they, it's, it's, it's different in Zim because Zim, like you said, is just rural, but there they're actually mm. carving out different things. So what, in terms of funding now mm. um, for, for drone startups or any, even the drone space, the differences in Zim. I know Zim is mm. near non-existent when it comes to funding. Mm. Um, VCs never come into Zim. Like, mm. how can you expect someone to come when they don't know what the rate is going to be tomorrow? Mm. So what, what is it like in Kenya in terms of opportunities for not just drone startups, but just any sort of startup? Yeah, so Kenya already is a tech hub landscape. Mm. Um, a lot of people call it the Silicon Valley of Africa. Um, in Nairobi specifically. And looking at that as a technology company ourselves, you know, we went in there and we're like, okay, cool, what are the kind of, you know, spaces? How are people actually funding these projects? A lot of them are, uh, or startups, or some of the startups that we've seen um, are able to access um, some sort of, you know, venture capital or be it uh, grants in themselves mm -hmm. where you have local institutions that actually give grants towards tech companies to say, hey, here's a start let's give you a start in this and try this out, mm. you know. So there's, an, there's almost like an environment that is promoting, uh, you know, startups, people with ideas, people with viable solutions, right, mm. um, and giving them a chance to test them before we even do an equity mm. kind of, <laughs> you know, raise and that kind of thing, right? Mm. Um, you can actually borrow money. You know, it might not be a lot, mm. right, but it can get you started. Right. And I think that's part of what we are lacking, um, you know, not only in Zimbabwe, but, you know, in a lot of countries across Africa is that start. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is the difference between your, you know, larger kind of more advanced uh, drone companies, your zip lines, your wing copters, mm -hmm. your uh, wing tra uh, kind of uh, drone platforms. If you look at their stories, the thing that made them get to where they are now uh, at the rate at which they did is really the funding. Right. It's not that the idea was so brilliant, mm. right? There's no ownership of ideas there. You know, there's nothing amazing about the idea of what they're doing. But, but the funding aspect, mm. because they're ac able to access funding in their home countries or people mm. who are saying, let's invest in this because they can see the future of it. Yeah. Now they're able to do all this. They're able to 
get the money mm. that allows them to do research and development, mm. right? Make the mistakes, yep, yep. fix the prototypes, and get them to a viable product. Yeah. Mm. So the whole prototypes is, is, is the big debate now because mm. the last time we spoke, you were like, you're actually trying to design products for the Zimbabwean market specifically, mm. uh, not just co-opt mm. other companies. Uh, I know the, the, the skeleton of the infrastructure will be basically the same, like how engine manufacturers go from, you know, one, one coming to the next. You want to now make specific use cases for Zim and that funding is, is obviously lacking. So how's that hampering your progress? Like if you if you had like a million dollars that you're given by a VC, they're like, yeah, go crazy. Um, how, how far would that accelerate the plans you have now? If you could name any of the, of the, of the stuff you're working on in terms of hardware or software. Wow, a million bucks. Oof, I can do a lot with a million bucks. <laughs> First of all, I'm going to buy a cheeseburger because <laughs> I ain't had one of those in a while. Right, mm. uh, and that's probably the only amount that I'll spend of that yeah. one million on myself. Yeah. Right, FYI. Yeah. Um, but really, looking at um, a local context, mm. I'm always uh, one to look at um, solving problems. Mm. Right, what problem are we solving? I'm not one to say let's build it for the sake of building something. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Why? You know, you don't just. It's not about looking cool. Yeah. And all these companies that we look at and look up to, especially in my industry, in the drone mm. industry, they're solving a problem. They're meeting a need that mm. exists. So let's look at locally. What mm. are the needs? Where are the gaps and the challenges? How is our economy functioning? Mm. Right? How can we help people? What do the communities need? Mm. So off the bat, two areas come to mind, agriculture mm. and um, healthcare. Right? Those are two immediate needs. And, and it, it's the same across you know, a lot of countries around the world, but in Zimbabwe in particular. Mm. Right? Food security is a big issue. How can we leverage the technology? How can we build platforms and systems that will help us to actually boost food security, mm. to deal with pests, Right and mm. disease and that kind of thing that affect our crops. When we do actually go out there to the farms and we do produce the crop and we try and that kind of thing, yeah. how can we get rid of, you know, we've got issues to do with fall army worm, we've got locusts. Right now, currently, we've got quila birds as an yeah. issue. How can we leverage technology to do that? Those are the areas where I would put the money towards and say, let's build our own. So right here, we've got a crop spraying drone, yeah. for example, right? Uh, this is one of the crop sprays that we can use um, that's multifunctional in terms of spraying different pesticides and and um, fertilizers and that kind of thing, right? Mm. Why can't we build our own? Mm. Right. This one has a 16 liter tank. The nozzle spray points here. All of this stuff. These are all different parts and that kind of thing. Um, why can't we make them here? There's nothing super special about the materials here, mm. right? But it takes that building of an industry and putting in the money towards people who make nozzles <laughs> for cross spraying drones. Yeah. People who can make tanks, right? Yeah. To modify this tank and make it bigger. We can do 16 liters. Why not make it a 20 liter? All right? And modify yeah. it ourselves. Yeah. Right? So I would start at that point and saying, let's take existing models, modify. I'm not trying to build it from scratch initially because I will sink the whole 1 million. Yeah. And in just R&D. R yeah. <laughs> right? But I can take a platform like this and modify it. Mm. All right? I'll start to build the back end and do that kind of thing. Mm. Do the same with uh, healthcare. Yeah. Right? We need drones that can carry cargo. We need be, to be able to get uh, blood samples, um, medication to people in rural communities or you know, semi-urban kind of situations. Right? Yeah. There are women who are uh, dying in childbirth because you know, they lose a lot of blood and they can't get blood to them fast enough. That's a reality today. Yeah. How can we use the technology to help? And we can do it. Yeah. We can take models. We can build our own. Or we can take existing models and then increase the capacity of these models. Globally, this industry is emerging. There's no one who's got a foothold to say, we've got the 100% solution for this, right? Mm. We can develop our own solution as well. And that's really where I would, I mean, I would put the money into to doing that, into solving problems, um, ultimately. Mm. Yeah, so solving the, the gaps and the, finding the gaps in the market and solving mm. the problems is, is, is the main aim. And the systems you, know, you were talking about earlier were, were modular systems. So Zimbabwe is we want to be as cost effective as possible because we can't get these materials all the time. Yeah. So most of these systems would have to be modular, correct? Um, yeah, I mean, to some extent, uh, there's, you know, your basic frame of any kind of drone and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, you want a reliable system, a tried and tested platform, and even your local authority, local, you know, country representatives, they have a, the responsibility to, to uphold the standards, mm. right? So kind of like your SAZ. <laughs> it has to meet the Standards Association yeah. kind of parameters. But in our case, the Standards Association would be the Civil Aviation Authority, mm. right? Because they regulate and manage the airworthiness and do the inspections of aircraft, which drones are aircraft. So I would look at it from perspective of, you know, initially modifying existing platforms. Mm. So taking an existing platform 
and modify it or retrofit it with other tools or other platforms that can either increase its efficiency mm. or help it to do other things. All right. So, for example, we have what's called like a, a DJI Metri 600 drone, mm. right? And that drone comes without a payload, so it doesn't come with a camera or anything like that kind of sensor. You add whatever you want to it. Okay. So you could put a big film camera on it. Or you can put a thermal sensor for nice. night duties. Or you can put a, a multispectral sensor for um, mapping um, your farm areas and that kind of thing and get soil, I'm sorry, plant, crop and plant health assessments. Or we can retrofit it and carry medicines. All right? Yeah. A little thing like that. Make sure it's a, it's got, you know, kind of a thing that can keep it cold. A little kind of like a cold <laughs> room type of thing, yeah. right? We can retrofit it. Same drone, but different modification yeah. and different use case. We could do that. And that's really where I would look and say, let's start there and reverse engineer ourselves to say, okay, here's what we can do here. Let's f figure out how we can then build the whole frame ourselves. Kind of like what China did um, with, the, with, with, the, with, the, with, every, with every industry they had. Mm. Uh, I remember the one, the famous one was put, they bought Russian I think, SU-35s, mm. got them into China secondhand, and they just reverse engineered, they just built mm. uh, models. But that then led China to have its, its own industry. Mm. Because you can't then, if you R and D is expensive, people think that why don't you just build them yourselves? Yeah. This stuff takes millions of dollars exactly. to to get, and it's yeah. it, it's the number. Like, correct me if I'm wrong. How many people would you need to consult for every single component? Let's say you're doing it from scratch, like today. Oh, it's a lot. Eh? It's a lot of people. I can't even tell you how many people because they have different people making different parts. China's, you know, got it down to a T because they have a whole bunch of different skill sets. So mm. they can go here, here, here. They, we don't have the industry to say, okay, I'll get the nozzles from there. I'll get the carbon fiber frame done from there, the mm. propellers from there. We don't have that yet. You know what I mean? So you would now need to be doing a lot of, like, searching around to find people. Oh, it'll take a lot to put this thing yeah. together. And the way yeah. Zimbabweans are not online or anywhere. <laughs> you need to get WhatsApp contacts from someone who knows someone who knows someone. And that number might not even be in use for Zimbabweans. <laughs> So it's yeah, it's so the work is really ahead. So what in Kenya? What did you see getting to that point where is Kenya ready for them to become a manufacturer, a producer, a developer, a designer of, of unmanned aerial systems? So I got it right this time. Last time I said unmanned aerial vehicles, and you're like ah, that 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 term is fading out. <laughs> Not really you, UAS. No, you got it right. UAS unmanned aerial systems for sure. Um, or remotely piloted aircraft systems. Yeah. Yeah. You see, there's always yeah. something. There's, 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 there's different always something. There's different stuff to it. Yeah, but I mean, I was privileged to go and uh, while I was in Kenya and Nairobi specifically, I went to visit a good friend of mine now. Um, her name is Anne Nderitu. She is co-founder of a you know, startup called Swift Labs. And they're actually uh, manufacturing their own fixed-wing drones. Um, they've got their prototype to a point where it's a minimum viable product. Mm. Um, and looking at now doing production and scale. Um, they've got this platform, it operates, it flies, um, and they're looking at you know, increasing its capacity to carry a payload of between two to four kgs, you know, which is pretty big. Mm. Um, it sounds like a small number, but it's a big number when it <laughs> comes yeah. to different drone platforms and that kind of thing. So you know, seeing that firsthand and just being there in that space mm. is super encouraging to say, wow, okay, Africans are doing it. Yeah. We're doing it for ourselves. We're not just looking and seeing, oh, so-and-so did it in Germany or in the United States or Australia or whatever. All right? We're like, mm. no, no, no. Africans came together and they put this thing together. But fair and fine, um, to get to that point, they had a bit of funding support. Not a lot, but mm. they got the funding support to be able to do that. And Anne herself, she's an, um, uh, I think an aeronautical engineer or aircraft maintenance engineer, one of the two. Right. Um, so these are skill sets that exist. Mm. It's not that like you need a special skill set, mm. right, to be able to do this. And we don't have the skill set. We have the skill set, right, to do the work. Um, but we just need to get everything else to come together for us to be able to move in advance. So it was super encouraging, super, super, super encouraging to see that happening um, in Kenya. Mm. And uh, in terms of skills transference, when it comes to actual manufacturing itself, like mm. what are the things that you learned about? Uh, because obviously they're, they're like, let's say, a, a, a quote-unquote generation ahead in terms of manufacturing. What did you learn from, from the trip in terms of what, what they're doing there? Yeah, so, so what I was seeing from Swift Labs is, um, and I'm not sure if it's, if it's a lesson per se, but mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're also reverse engineering the growth of an industry. So because they're building out this drone themselves, right, they need specific parts. Yeah. So now they're also creating a demand for those specific parts with other people who maybe engineer 
different steel kind of um, components, other people who were involved in carbon fiber, other people were involved in, you know, like the plastics used for the propellers and that kind of thing, right? Mm. So now by you building, you're creating now work and jobs for other downstream kind of industries and spaces. So by the time they get to production, mm. they know they can't build everything in-house, but they'll have people locally within Kenya, right, as much as possible, mm. who can then help them and give them these different parts and that kind of thing. And for me, the value is that in, in, you know, the more they push to do it themselves, mm. the more they grow other industries and yeah. other people's businesses as well um, as they, they move forward. So any companies in Zimbabwe that you can speak of who are in the same space who you see as probably partners or in, in the drone space specifically? Uh, as far as I know, no. I don't know anyone who's manufacturing um, drones here. Um, and I can't speak of people who assemble drones by themselves at home and that kind of thing. I mean, we do that. We've done that. And, you know, it's different to building your own drone that you just fly in your yard and that kind of thing. We're talking about something that has production value, commercial value yeah. that can actually be used uh, for a specific purpose outside of personal entertainment. Okay. Um, so in Zimbabwe, as far as I know, at this stage, we don't have that. And it's a, it's a big gap. Mm. So what about in terms of uh, doing, we're doing relatively in the same space as you are, like, mm. let's say, training? And um, mm. are there any other companies that are, like, you can say, yeah, well, we, we, we've worked with or partnered um, over the years, or we admire at the very least? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think for us, um, there, there are other companies that have started to get into the training space um, as well, which is good and it's very encouraging because we need more of it. And I mm. think there's, there's a need for, you know, the pillars that I call in the industry, the training arm. Training is really, really important. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there are other companies now that are getting into the space. Uh, I think we have one company that was recently certified by Civil Aviation to start issuing uh, remote pilot licenses, um, of which we're also in the process of getting our license to do the same. Um, so there is that in terms of development. But in terms of looking up to companies, unfortunately, you know, we haven't had the privilege of being able to have a, a model right or an example that we can look to of a company that is actually certified um to operate drones that's tra has trained and licensed personnel within mm. the operations that know what they're doing and how to do it that didn't learn from trial and error but have actually been trained they, they we just didn't have that landscape so that's why we took the approach that we took um mm. where we positioned ourselves as the people who are actually trained and licensed and are able to then deliver the use case applications so we've had to become the model for other companies and other people who are starting up um, to say, okay, you know what? We're actually not uh, a legitimate company mm. until we have the certification um, required, which are global standards right now. Mm. I mean, if you look at other countries, they, they've they got, you know, you can't go to a drone company, like, oh, we offer drone services, and there's no one in your company who's got a minimum, a pilot license. Mm. And your pilot license is a minimum. Mm. You know, most often you need your pilot license plus additional ratings, Plus, the company itself needs to have a license to operate drones, of which in Zimbabwe at present, there's still none. Mm. There still isn't even one in Zimbabwe, including us. Mm. You know, we're in the process of getting ours for the operator certificate. Mm. But, you know, even as it stands now, you know, there's still a lot of gaps. And, you know, we've had to kind of, you know, be like, okay, set the standard uh, in a lot of areas. So what's the holdup with the, with the uh, operator certificate? Um, at this stage now, it's industry. It's now the industry. It's okay. now us, the people. So uh, aviation have now gone to plane, and this is current. This is as at a few weeks ago, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, you know, so aviation have now put it out there to say, look, if you want your remote operator certificate or RPAS operator certificate, mm. come through, start the process. But it is a long process, right? Okay. And people don't realize what it takes to set up uh, uh, a drone company uh, mm. or an ROC. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it's something that does take time, takes a lot of paperwork, it also requires, like I've, I mentioned, is the personnel within your company have to have the right skill set mm. to do it. And there in Zimbabwe, there's mm. been a big gap in that you have one or two people in the organization, probably the guys leading it, mm. who understand drone tech, mm. but they themselves probably aren't licensed. They themselves haven't invested in getting trained and getting the expertise. Mm. They've just gotten guys, here are drones, let's teach you how to fly drones. Okay, cool, great, you figured it out. Go, let's go. We start offering services. That's not proper. Yeah. But that's what we have the majority of here in Zimbabwe. So basically it's the Wild West when it comes to drones. 100%. But things are starting to align. Things okay. are starting to now formalize. And the civil aviation is doing work to do that. Not enough in terms of public awareness. Yeah. I think they haven't done anything in terms of public awareness. 
um, which is also part of where we're coming in to try and help and say, look, let help us, you know, we can be the voice, we can speak to the industry and say, look, guys, it's open now. Come get your remotely piloted aircraft systems, operator certificates, mm. go get training, get licensed, etc, etc. Yeah. So how long do you think it'll be for the, before the crackdown, crackdown, quote unquote, on the hobbyists begin? Like people who just, you know, start sipping about uh, drones in their backyards and into people's yards? Oof. Um, I don't know if I should say this on record, but um, <laughs> uh, from what I've seen yeah. uh, globally across Africa and the work that we do across Africa and in, in talking to civil aviations in different parts of Africa and being involved in a yeah. lot of different things in other countries, um, in other countries where they're actually regulated properly, uh, there will never come a time where there will be a proper crackdown yeah, okay. on the recreational guys. What will happen is that um, the commercial operations where the money is, yeah. right? The requirement for them to align is where the emphasis will be put. It won't be just on the general masses, yeah. right? So you will still find in the most highly regulated or well-regulated countries, there's still more people who fly unregulated Right, doing their own social kind of flying and maybe a bit of filming and that kind of thing, than those who are in the formal commercial uh, space where they're licensed. It's just the way the way it is because there's no enforcement at a level of actual like police getting involved and be like, okay, we saw a drone, we're gonna go and arrest this person. Nah, it's not gonna happen. What will happen is if someone's flying in a place they shouldn't be flying, okay, hundred mm. percent, but not just in general. Yeah. yeah. So that'll be something yeah. like a military base if you're dumb enough to get your your drone above there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so you'll get in. You'll really get in trouble yeah. if you fly where you're not supposed to fly. And if, look, if you're not trained, you're not gonna know where to fly and exactly. not to fly. So it's only a matter of time before yeah. you get in trouble. So it's like, if, for example, like in town, you could just fly yeah. over a building that could be deemed as a you know a government space or classified zone, and they'll they'll really they'll they'll, they'll make an effort to find you, right? Uh, not really, not necessarily. They right. won't necessarily make an effort to find you mm. uh, unless you are literally like, yeah, literally over a an important government building. <laughs> Which right? you will not name. Right. <laughs> and and you're flying um, any or any important government building mm. and you're flying close enough to the space, right, where they can actually find you and that kind of thing. Right. Okay. So if it's an important enough building, I mean, they could shoot it down, the drone, then they're going to find you. One way or another, they will trace, trace, you know, track you down and find you. But in general, like now with drones, you can be three k's away; they won't even know. You see what I mean? And you're flying for a few minutes, so by the time they see what you're doing and da da da, you might have done what you want to do, and you're off. They might not find you hmm. per se, but if they do find you and catch you, poof, you're gonna have a tough time. <laughs> yeah, a tough time. So, might, might you think yeah. that this is something that they would rope into stuff like cybersecurity? Because we've been talking about the cybersecurity and data protection bill for a while. Hmm. So, drones are in that weird space where they they kind of merge the two. Where you get the the, the the airspace, the physical version of it, but all this information can be relayed to a computer or something. Yes. So, are we going to get like a, a point where it, drones are going to be classified as both by the uh, regulated by both the civil aviation authority mm. as well as the let's say Ministry of Information, for example, as it, it both overlaps because it kind of works in, the, in tandem. Jeez, I hope not, eh? <laughs> that will that'll make it tough for people. Yeah. That'll really make it tough if we have double regulation mm. because. They won't align because on one on one hand, you know, we're regulated by you know the civil aviation regulations uh, for drone operations, and that that is more about airspace, yeah. right? Learning about the airspaces, where to fly, where not to fly, safety concerns, you know, how close, you know, uh, how far away you have to be from buildings and people and that yeah. kind of thing, right? Now, if you're looking about information itself, right? Yeah. Um, the information now in terms of actually gathering mm. and disseminating information and sharing, mm. that now looks at completely different things, mm. right? And now you're literally going to have to have some sort of, I don't know, some sort of secure way <laughs> that the government approves mm. that allows you to, let's say, for example, stream. Because some people stream, yeah. you know, I mean, footage from that. Or they'll be like, okay, cool, right? Maybe you're saving it onto your, your micro SD card and that kind of thing, mm. right? How do we know that you're not recording this or that? Or how do we know that your drone can't be hacked? Mm. You know what I mean? And yeah. taken over and used yeah. by that kind of thing. I mean, the moment you do that, it means you are now looking at double compliance, right? And now you have to prove, no, I'm not actually filming that. I'm doing this and doing that. It could become really complicated. Mm if we look at the cybersecurity side of things. So, so I, I really hope it doesn't go there. So basically it's just let 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 
drones or you know uh, unmanned aerial systems be managed by one thing the civil aviation authority everything yeah, else is yeah. definitely going to be up for debate and i don't think zimbabwe is at the the industry is at a mature level yet where they could mm. preempt regulation about where you're filming this or that yeah. but this doesn't stop anyone who sees a drone on their property to shoot it down i think that's let's manage it case by case <laughs> if i see it in my yard i might as well uh yeah. if it's not allowed to be there then, then then i might as well so in terms of utilities um zimbabwe's got a lot of services parastatals and whatnot that could use drones mm -hmm. um the nrz is one i think of often that yeah mm. we are okay comically because of the zuko co-opting another transport entity in the government to run train buses mm. which in itself it can do because the the railway act actually allows it to do that but yeah. Zimbabwe is weird like that yeah. um so what are the what are the parasitals government agencies have come to you and said you know we want to try and incorporate drones in what we do um and for what reasons if you can speak about it yeah funny enough just between me and you i've got some footage of railways if you want Hey, oh, yeah. this guy's been teasing me with B-roll. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we, we can talk after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I was I was thinking about using drone tech for railways um, on my drive back from a project. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we ended up capturing some, you know, one of the railway intersections, like where they all meet. So we've got mm -hmm. all these railways and that kind of thing. So it's pretty cool. But I really see like the use case for for you know NRZ to be using drones from a security standpoint because yeah. a big issue they have is infrastructure theft. Yeah. You know, a lot of money, millions, I think, get lost in infrastructure theft. People stealing those sleepers and all sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, bring in some drones with thermal cameras and night vision capabilities. We could really do do well there. Yeah. You know. Um, but in the more of a, you know looking at who's actually doing things that matter <laughs> and value, um, you know I've got to give uh, credit to uh, Zesa or ZDTDC mm. uh, because you know in the background they've been working on something for a while now and they're really looking at leveraging the technology uh, for inspections mm. and you know of the power lines and that kind of thing. So from that perspective, you know I'm really encouraged that they have taken a progressive approach recognizing the technology and actually yeah. starting to move towards it. It takes time. Yeah. A lot of people think it's just you buy a drone out, you know, from the shelf and you come and you start using it. No, you, you in an actual commercial context and for an organization the size of like ZETDC yeah. or any kind of parastatal government entity, it requires well thought through program, which you build and develop. You know, yeah. people need to be trained. You need to develop operations manual. You need to develop policies around the technology, how it's used, maintenance. You need to have some sort of, you know, supply chain or different parts and that kind of thing. You need to have a way to manage the data that mm -hmm. you're going to gather as well. You need, you know, different computers to process the data. You know, but people just think, oh, we just buy a drone and get it to fly and it's done, you know. And, you know, that the knowledge and understanding of how to build a drone program also mm -hmm. is part of what we're trying to help with and come into the space and be like, okay, cool. This is how you build a program. Mm -hmm. Not this is how you buy a drone and mm -hmm. get it to work. This is how you build a program that works that actually returns value on your investment. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, for a commercial entity uh, or even parasitical government, it has to make sense financially. You can't mm. just invest because it's cool. Yeah. Right? Um, so looking at ZTDC, they're really making an effort um, to do that. And uh, we're encouraged that, you know, we're even able to help and assist in, in any way that we can um, with that process. Uh, but for the most part, it's, it's them taking the lead and mm. wanting to move that forward. It's good to hear because mm. infrastructure theft, especially for companies like you know, Zessa and Taiwan, they've been, you know, stuff has been going, copper lines have been going missing all the mm. time. It's good to see them taking a, mm. an advanced, proactive approach uh, to it rather than sitting back and relying on old methods like getting people out there. Um, in terms of things that are cool, this is something that is a bit of a personal gripe for me. So, uh, Zingsa, Zimbabwe satellite program, I've, I've made fun of it a bunch of times. Um, now, I'm not making, making fun of it because I'm, I'm saying Zimbabwe shouldn't have a satellite. Satellite technology is great, it offers us a bunch of things we, we, we never had before. But one of the key use cases was mapping. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. We can map it with drones. Like, wouldn't it be infinitely cheaper to map swathes of land with drones than it would be to launch satellite, for example? I'm asking you as the expert rather than me, who's just, a, you know, talking out the side of his neck. Is, is, is that the space agency thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. That's the one they launched. Yeah, recently. they're, they're supposedly the launching a satellite next year. Geospatial space yeah, yeah. agency. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Look, I mean, I haven't really looked at it uh, too much mm. um, to be able to, you know, to speak on it and be like, oh, this and that. You're being diplomatic, man. Um, You're being very diplomatic. <laughs> but for sure, I'm not the expert, first yeah. and foremost, um, on this kind of stuff. I'm just, you know, I'm a student of the game. Mm. All right. And for me, I'm like, okay, uh, we don't think through things enough. 
as a nation or people who are at the forefront of pursuing these kind of things, mm. right? Um, for me, just like you've mentioned, right, the drones have come in at a point where they can give us highly accurate data and information that we couldn't get previously mm. at the same price, okay? So if you'll find that in countries that are more advanced, more advanced satellites than us, way more satellites in the air, are still using drone tech for the mapping, it means then also still they haven't been able to get the cost of mapping with satellites to a price that's cheaper than what's available using drone tech. Mm. You know what I mean? Now, we have to look at scale as well. If you're looking at mapping a whole country, mm. satellite is the way to go. Definitely. Drones can't. Right? Uh, for me, I'm like, if that's what we're looking at doing, how often are you going to map the whole country? Does it require a whole satellite in the air to just map the country once a month or once every six months and that kind of thing? Mm. Is that the entire use case? I hope not. Yeah, me too. I really hope it's not that. I mean, mm. some satellites in the air and they help with internet, for yeah. example, and that kind of thing. Maybe it's multiple use cases. But if the selling point is we're putting it up there so we can map, then I'm not sure if that was, you know, the best idea. But well, I'm pretty sure they have different use yeah, cases. Yeah, there's obviously mineral yeah. exploration. They're going to use it for, you know, mm. satellite prospecting, which is interesting. Yeah. There's actually a Zimbabwean startup that's, that, that's, that's, that's dabbling in the space. Mm. Uh, but I feel like all of those are um, far removed from what we need in terms of cost. Now, this is me being a critic because I think yeah. you should use what you have. Zimbabwe, we, we're not at the, like, it's like going out. If I go out right now, I'm not going to go sit at, you know, Coffee Republic or Jam Tree. Chicken in. I know I'm going to get good value for two bucks, so that's what I can afford right now. This, this, now, scale it up to Zimbabwe. Yeah. Why launch a satellite for, for tens of millions of dollars? Train people for millions of dollars. Mm. Send them to Japan. Apparently, that's where they went for millions of dollars. When they start up like Precision Area, who are doing, who can, you can start leveling up. We can start mapping or whatever they want to do from drones and then scale up to the satellites once, once we understand, once we've, we've gotten the, the, the run of the game. Because for me, it, 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 I, I'm not against innovation. I'm not being a, a Luddite. I'm just saying, mm. It is counter. It is counterproductive to local companies who are trying to build things. Mm. You're not recognizing people who are actually really doing good work. And the quote is Zimbabwe's open for business. Is it just international business, or are we also looking at, at local business? Because, from my standpoint, it seems like it's more of international business because the, the quote usually comes when they're at big co conferences and summits, but it never reflects to companies like Precision Area where, yeah, they mm. they've got uh, vertical takeoff and land off drones, fixed mm. wing that can do the work you want to be done. Uh, I remember you were talking about. Um, way back about uh, cycling and die and how you tried to help and they were mm. like, nah, mm. we're not having that. Mm. Now, how does that make you feel as a young startup trying to build something in Zimbabwe? Like, will you get rebuffed consistently when you, when you actually have the tools to be able to help? Yeah. Um, mm. You know, I think being a tough person, you know, just around the world in any kind of space and trying to break into a market is tough already. Uh, then you add and compound that with the conditions we find ourselves here in, in Zimbabwe, it's even harder. Mm. You know, and um, for me, I, I'm looking at just what you're saying is just uh, from perspective of what the government is doing in terms of building in and bringing a satellite, for example, right? For me, I'm like, okay, the thinking through part of it is where's the business case, right? How much money are we going to make or is that satellite going to be able to pay for itself mm. and over what period of time? Mm. Which brings in what you're saying is why aren't we using what we have already? We have drone tech. We have the ability to do that. And this is purely looking at only one use case for the satellite, remember? We're mm. looking at the mapping only. Yeah. I'm not saying it's the only use case, but yeah. let's say looking at that, right? You're putting a satellite in the air. It's going to cost you millions of dollars. What about the maintenance, guys? How much is the satellite going to cost us to keep it in the air mm. and keep stuff running for the next 10 to 15 years versus the value of the data that mm. we're going to be gathering mm. of it, all right? Is the data priced at that kind of value, mm. right, where it makes sense to invest all these millions? Or would it be better to invest in drone tech at a much cheaper price, but still get way, you know, really, really good data? You know, that's where I'm like, are we thinking through or are we doing things for optics, right? And oftentimes, to be honest, it's someone has a brilliant idea, they want to look good, they're trying mm. to push their position because they hold a certain position mm. and they want to push this forward, they go sell it, they pitch for it, They somehow they get budget funding for it and use our tax money, mm. which I'm paying. Mm. So I'm very jealous about my tax money. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, guys, I'm paying. Mm. Right? So, you know, that's my money mm. that you're using to build satellites at the end of the day. Yeah. Right? So I'm like, okay, I was, is that the best use at this very current time? Mm. Now, if you show me a business model, 
you know, great. But I'm not sure if that's you know, what's there right now. I'm, I'm not sure. And I, 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 you know, the little, I only have very little information about it, so I can't really comment. But as a young person, you know, uh, you know involved in tech, um, for me, it's all about the landscape, right? What's the environment? Is the environment that you're in an, an enabling environment that allows you to grow, to innovate, to do what you need to do? Or is it holding you back? Mm. Guaranteed, our banking financial system and sector well is holding us back in ways that I can't even be, be, begin to describe, mm. right? The hassle, the time that it takes, the issues. I mean, we do projects and we do jobs where, you know, we've been asked to do some work, you know, outside the country. We said, okay, okay, we'll go and we'll go to another country, South Africa, Kenya, hey, come do some work. Mm. But we want the money to come here. Right? Yeah. I'm the one who's paid for myself to be skilled to where I am to mm. be able to provide these services. But I want the money to come here. Mm. Money comes here and they take 20% of my money and they change it to RTGS mm. at the bank rate, which we know is not <laughs> It's not the real it's thing. It's not practical. Yeah. It's yeah. on the ground. Yeah. I can't talk about fair because that's completely not fair yeah. at the end of the day. And I'm like, but how do I grow as a startup? If, you, if you're going to do that, then you'll tax me on top of that as well. Yeah. That's not an enabling environment. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. The issues with the rate, the disparity between the bank rate and the you know other rate there, you know, leaving it that way, and not dealing with the problem mm. is creating a problem in itself. Yeah, but even even the auction system itself, it, it was a case of mm. um, trying to trying to trying to restrict the parallel market rate as, as good as they can. Now it worked for three months, three four months. We're at eighty five. Mm. The, mm. the parallel market from reports it mm. was around one hundred, one ten, and stayed there for quite a while. Now it was reported at one fifty, one sixty. Yeah. Clearly, it's failed. So. Why try to overcompensate regulation when you, when, you, when you can let things through? The beauty, of the, the beauty and the curse of this is that it filters down to everywhere. Because mm. now we then see it at every single level. For startups, for example, I was talking to uh, Victor Mapunga, Flex Fintechs. I've, I've spoken about his startup like three or four times in articles mm. this week. It's frustrating to know that he's being ignored. He's Okay, they, they, they were selected for the World Economic Forum startup uh, cohort. It's where like Spotify and whatnot made, made, their, made their thing. So at the time I looked at it, I was like, this is excellent for Zim. Then he came to me and he's like, you know, why, why aren't Zim startups being recognized a lot more? Like, we're, we're going there to accelerators and incubators when we're doing things. We're not getting a startup act, first of all, hmm. to make it possible for us to get favorable loan rates since there's no investment in Zim. Hmm. Uh, there's no investment hubs that open in Zim. Hmm. The government started this national venture capital thing and they've got 300 million local currency, which to distribute across the big startups in Zim won't work. Uh, it's simply not enough. And the way they're ignored, the way there's no favorable environment for them hmm. to work in, uh, the way laws are still based on paper transactions. I know they recently passed the e-commerce law recently. I haven't, mm. to be honest, I haven't gone through it. Mm. But all of those things, we are so behind. Mm. And the environment makes it worse and worse and worse for startups like yours to actually work. Like, for example, if you were to start, if you wanted to start a subscription service, let's say someone wanted to rent uh, a drone and you didn't, they want to just subscribe to pay online, they would have to pay every single time using Eagle Cash or Swipe or come here to Precision Aero mm. to pay. There is no system that allows debit orders. That as long as you have the drone and you haven't cancelled the subscription, Precision Aero is going to keep taking their money. You have bought their property mm. up until mm. the point. There's no the financial system is so broken that I think broken is the right term to use. Mm. That it's 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 not allowing startups to breathe. And for you from afar, and this is me just making gross assumptions, and you had to, to correct me. Yeah. But I'm saying in your case, it's like there is so much more you could be doing on a business side instead of a technical side. Because yeah. technical side, obviously, that's a whole other story. Mm. But the business side of it, there's so much more you, products and services you could offer, yeah. but you can't because of the restrictions. Am I, you know, in the ballpark of my, <laughs> again, talking nonsense? Yeah, I mean, like, for us now, because we've created a brand that is not just Zimbabwean, but represents Africa, yeah. um, we're often called and asked to come, oh, come help, come train us here, come do this with us there, and that kind of thing in other countries, right? And then you get there and, you know, you're talking to people and people are like, what are you doing in Zimbabwe? <laughs> I mean, what are you even doing? You're like, just, you know, just move, just like whatever, you know. But I love my country and I'm, you know, I'm a diehard Zimbabwean, you know, person and stuff like that. I was born and raised here and I love I loved the country. I don't love how, you know, things are happening and things are being done. Mm. But the, the country didn't do anything to anyone. Like mm. you can take everyone out of the country and the country still remains yeah. good. Right. Let's not say that the environment mm. in itself is good. Yeah. The environment in terms of the air, mm. right? The weather, yeah. great. It's the sightseeing, tech. great. Yeah. Right. Mm. The working environment is not good. Yeah. Right. And it's tough. Right. But those are the things that we have to navigate and try and work through. And for me, I'm like, what I would want to see um, is a merit-based kind of system, where the people who are genuinely good at what they're doing, who are legitimate, mm. right, are the ones who shine through mm. whereas here 
it's more of a who do you know type of thing, right? Uh, apparently, I've heard you can go to a bank and get a bank loan, and the banks will actually give you money, and they actually have money. But me as a startup, can I walk into a bank today and go and get a loan? Heck no. Wow. Unless I know someone, yeah. unless I'm related to the bank manager or someone in the director's thing, mm. right? Mm. It's not happening, yeah. right? And let's say they do entertain my request for it, right? The amount of paperwork they ask for, the financials they want, audit financials for the last three years of a startup, of a, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I you know what I mean? Yeah. We're, we're in the tech space. Like, yeah. there's no, the, that's where now why venture capital shines through is mm. because people recognize the vision. Yeah. They recognize that this could be something, has potential to be something. Mm. And they have different metrics they use. They don't look at you like you're a manufacturing plant and mm. say, okay, cool. Show us your the machinery and the outputs and the da, 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 you know what I mean. Yeah. If we could have an approach where we have even a single bank, right, one bank, right, or these financiers or whatever it is, that really genuinely looks at startups and me, I'm speaking now specifically tech companies from the perspective, right, of where we're coming from and the environment we're in, and not asking us to fit in this box of give us all these financials, give us all these security things. Let's do da, da, da. no. Let's look at context of. What could you be like if we helped you in this way? Mm. Start off. Don't give me all this paperwork. Mm. Start me off small. Give me 10,000 years. Take a risk. Mm. 10,000 is not a lot. Right? Take mm. the risk. And it comes with equity anyway. So, exactly. yeah. yeah. I mean, if you, it needs to be equity, great. I, yeah. mean, I, I ain't giving you equity. If you give me 10,000, I ain't giving you nothing. <laughs> yeah, for 10,000, I mean, you 10, 000, I ain't giving you nothing. <laughs> you know, I'll give you interest, but I ain't giving yeah. you ain't no equity for 10 grand. Mm. Um, but grow from there. You know? yeah. At least start it. Yeah. At least have show a little bit of faith. Of wanting to go there but really the truth of the matter is people are good at talking about how we want to support businesses it's nice to say um at speeches for these companies mm. and banks and all this kind of stuff but the reality of it is they're looking at bottom line what's going to give the bank money mm. and they'd rather loan it to their friends and people that they know mm. and say here yeah, okay i'll give you a mill go and spin it come back and do this or you know do it on your farm but the new guys, the tech guys, who we don't know, mm. oh, why would we give them money? Yeah, mm. it's like it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a quote unquote boys club now in in, 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 in banking. It's yeah. it's actually shocking that a bank hasn't actually started a uh, startup financing initiative. That they're not looking at at at, at they're, they're limiting the amount of red tape. Mm. They're making making sure that startups can get the funding because I think it, it speaks more to the culture of investing in Zimbabwe. Mm. A friend of mine uh, had a conversation a while back saying. They're more likely going to invest in something knowing how much they're going to get next month. Like I'm buying a property to get exactly. rent. That's so it. this is going to give me, you know, hundred dollars every month. I'll make my investment in 10, 15 months, right? Yeah. But with startups, you are like you said, vision and potential. Mm. So without that vision and potential, there couldn't have been a Google or Twitter or whatnot. Mm. And we're holding back the mm. local ecosystem mm. by not recognizing that. Because if you're seeing startups like Flex Fintechs, Tumeza going to international hubs, having to compete for money with, you know, other African startups and without an ecosystem in Zimbabwe, a financial ecosystem, let alone, let's, let's not even talk about the startup themselves forming an ecosystem because I think that's pre-fragmented as it is, but a financial ecosystem where the financing industry is, is vested the interest in these guys doing well. Hmm. Because this is where startups are building nations. We, we Let's not even joke about this. Like, 100%. The, like America is now, how can you have the sea of Google, Facebook and whatnot sitting in front of Congress? What does that tell you from where they came from back then when they were just yeah. regarded as little trifles and, mm. you know, phases? Now they they control swathes of the internet, like mm. Amazon, for example, mm. how much, mm. of, how, many, how many servers it owns around the world. So I don't think they see that. And I think that's that's detrimental to, to small progression. And again, the money is, is, is one thing that hurts me the most because it's nice to, like, for me as a writer, it's nice to write about a startup doing well, getting into an incubator. It's also, why aren't they getting these opportunities in Zim? Exactly. Why is there no one in Zim who's seeing mm. this potential? Mm. Why have they failed in Zim? Mm. And yeah, yeah, and, and and for me, you know, just hearing you say that, I just think about like, you know, you know, what I was sharing about is that, fine, you, you know, you got an incubator or you win some sort of grant outside there, right? And that money is supposed to come towards helping you scale, grow, or yeah. that kind of thing. You bring it here. The first thing the government does, it takes twenty percent. First thing, they don't recognize that you're an entrepreneur. Mm. Neither do they recognize that you or us as the people we earned that. Mm through whatever means, through mm. writing a good proposal, carrying the idea mm. to a point of, you know, being able to show value for it. So instead of recognizing and saying, right, cool, let's create a space here and say, all right, anyone who's a startup earning between X amount and X amount, we won't touch your money. Let's let you grow. Mm. Or you guys have taxes, reduced taxes, mm. right? To allow you, that's the creating the environment now. Mm. 
they see you literally, just like what you're saying, they see you literally like you are a property company that's been there for 20 years or a manufacturing company or whatever it is. They see, they see you exactly the same. A startup in them. And they, they, sh- they make you fit in the same kind of mold. And they say, oh, cool. Oh, you went out there and you did amazing. Oh, you're Zimbabwean. You're one of us. Great. Here's how we reward you. Thank you for doing all that amazing stuff out there. The money comes into this country. We're taking 20%. And then we're going to change it into RTGs. First. Oh, by the way, you still have to pay tax. Oh, yeah, At the same the rate way. as everyone else. Yeah. That was it, 14 But was. yes, we encourage innovation and tech and all this kind of stuff. But you're not, you're not Lip making service. Work. Yeah, you're not making it work. Because mm. again, that's one well, a contributor came by and said Zimbabwe needs a startup back. I think I'll leave a link to it. The mm. reasons why we need a startup back in Zimbabwe. Mm. Legislation that governs corporate businesses or enterprises differently than they do with entrepreneurship and startups. I think mm. that, that's, that's a vacuum that's missing that hasn't been addressed. I think they know about it. Mm. I'm sure they do. Because they're seeing other startups doing more like Kenya and Rwanda and Nigeria being like Nigeria is now pretty much the finance hub. Uh, of Africa in terms of fintech and all that. Mm. They, it's been allowed because of allowances that have been done through legislation, yeah. ad, advanced legislation, not wasting like ad, the, the e-commerce uh, and e- e- electronic transactions and commerce bill was a specific table since 2013, I think, from the draft mm. that I saw. It took until the pandemic now for us to have. How long will it take for a startup act? Hey man, we just, we, I guess for me, I'm just like, we've got to have hope and we've got to like, you know, keep knocking on the doors of, I guess, our leaders to encourage them to genuinely actually do the things that help young people in startups, not just talk about doing things. Mm. Yeah. That for me is like, let's take action. Let's actually do the things that matter. And uh, once we start doing that, and then I think we'll, we will start to get to a level playing field because right now it's, it's an uphill battle from the start. Yeah. So I want to thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you for inviting us over. We're done? Yeah, we're done. We could go on for hours. Nice. But we need to spare them. Nice. Nice. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you for having me. Having you what? You're having us. On like your platform. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you, you guys for coming well. out uh, to our space. Mm. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, I guess I'll talk about our guests. Can I, can I chime in now? Yeah, you can. Yeah, sure. Thing. Okay, cool. So thank you for joining us today. Um, so thank you, uh, TechZim uh, team, for joining us today. Uh, we had uh, the Zimbabwe Energy Supply Authority, ZESA, as well as ZETDC, join us with their counterparts from the government of Rwanda, who came to see us today. And we were basically just having a talk and you know sharing with them and somewhat of a little bit of a you know expose around um the different platforms that they could employ mm. in terms of uh power line inspections um, and utilities inspections they're really looking at leveraging the technology um in that way and we're really just in you know privileged that they came and asked us for help and uh yeah we're looking forward to you know helping them and assisting them to build out the program that will ultimately uh bring more energy efficiency and hopefully light up more homes for longer uh, <laughs> we hope um, yep. so yeah so it was good uh, really good to have them over and just good to be able to share you know as africans as and showcase what zimbabwe is doing and mm. you know the value that we bring to the table from a training perspective to the actual um, equipment hardware itself mm. uh, so looking forward to doing more with the government of rwanda as well as uh, with uh, our own local ZETDC team mm. Awesome. Yeah, there'll be an article on Texan very soon with the video of the presentation for those interested. Uh, I, you should be. You should actually watch it because some of the times he's talked about drones in his in his conferences and Zoom meetings, he's been very. You know, he cheated us on information. So on this one, he goes a little bit more in depth, a little bit more in depth than I than, than I've seen in a number of presentations. But thanks again to Honda and thanks to the Precisionario team for having us over for what seems like the whole day. <laughs> You've entertained us and kept us yeah very well informed about uh, drone tech. Thanks for coming out.